Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, the stronger and more valuable they become. That's, that's one thing that's very important. And then I want them to understand that a brand is what a business or a person does, but a reputation is what people remember and share. Always keep that in mind in everything you do. And if you build relationships and you're good to people and you look to support people wherever you can, then your reputation will grow. Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust, too, that you enjoyed my recent conversations with business strategist Ken Foster, author of The Courage to Change Everything, and with Dr. Jeff Spencer of Cornerman Coaching. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Ted Rubin. Ted is a digital marketer and brand strategist who first coined the term return on relationship, otherwise known as hashtag R on R, which you can find if you do a search in the social media. He's also the chief marketing officer of PhotoFi, a prolific author and even more prolific social media personality. Ted believes in looking people in the eye, even in today's digital world as clients and customers, and people for that matter, want a connection that adds value to their business. Looking someone in the eye conveys that you are paying attention and that you're in the moment, there, present with them. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal client. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get that clarity about your ideal client, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Ted talked to me about why communities are more powerful than just relationships. He explained how to build emotional connections on social media and how to really listen to people and look them in the eye on social media. And he also explained why he posts photos of his socks. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Ted Rubin. Hi. I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from near Miami, Fort Lauderdale area in the USA, Ted Rubin, who's a social marketing strategist. He's a keynote speaker and a brand evangelist, among other things. Welcome to the podcast, Ted. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Well, thank you, Jürgen. I'm so glad you guys reached out. Uh, Nice to be talking to somebody on the other side of the world. Yeah, and Sandy Everleth, who's uh, closer to where you are, she introduced us. She was our guest on episode 244 of the Innova Buzz podcast. She introduced us and suggested that we have a conversation. So big hello to Sandy. Big hello. To, I'm a big Sandy fan, and anybody that she recommends, I'm happy to support. So uh, really excited to be here. Fantastic. Well, Ted, you one of the things you did in your career was coined the term return on relationship. 
you're also the chief marketing officer of Photify and you've got a, a long marketing career. You're a prolific author. You've written books, including Return on Relationship and also how to look people in the eye digitally and the age of influence selling to the digitally connected customer. So with all of that, I think there's a theme through that to make marketing more human, which is very close to my heart, and also to actually use social media as social to connect with people rather than just as selling tools or on LinkedIn that people seem to think LinkedIn is a resume uh, uh, repository. So I'm really looking forward to digging into all of that with you today. But before we start talking about all of those things, social media and relationships and so on, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get to where you are today? And what were some of the big uh, milestones in that journey? Well, I will say we don't want to go through it all. I'm 62 years old. And that, <laughs> that, could, that could be a few hour podcast unto itself. I, I'm gonna, so I, I went to Cornell University. I was into uh, investment banking and sales. Really at heart, I've always been you know, kind of a salesperson. And I was taught early on that sales is really about relationships. I mean, certainly it's a numbers game, but if you build relationships, you build long-term um, clients and long-term people and long-term friends and long-term business associates. And I was always the guy that built bigger and stronger accounts versus the quantity. Um, just to fast forward a little bit, in the late 90s, I discovered the internet. I was fortunate to read an article when I was looking for a job, uh, which was an interview of Seth Godin. Um, Seth was talking about his company, Yo Your Dime, which was the first online direct marketing company. And after reading it, I was just, I was really taken by his whole philosophy. Um, he had not mm. coined the term permission marketing yet, but he was still, he was talking about these topics. Just like, you know, I talked about relationships before I started talking about return on relationship. And, um, I, I, at the end of the, at the end of the, um, article, the interviewer asked Seth, he said, well, you have a very interesting company. Do you have any job openings? And he said, well, I don't have any specific openings, but there's two kinds of people I'll always hire. I'll always hire smart people and people that know how to sell something that no one's ever sold before. And I just raised my hand. And at the time I was married and my wife at the time laughed because she said, why are you applying for a job when there's no job? And I wrote him a, a letter back when we actually typed and wrote letters. <laughs> and, and, um, and I said, um, I can sell anything and I'm smart. And I went to work for Seth. So that was really the beginning of this stage of my life. I've had a lot of different stages. I had to remake myself a number of times. And even from then, I read my, remade myself a few times. But I discovered the internet. I discovered online marketing. I, did, I was around when e-commerce was nothing more than a, than a catalog online. When online media was just magazines basically being made into PDFs and and put onto websites. So I really got a good view of this, but most importantly, I was in an office with Seth Godin and mm. I had been living in South Florida and my um, we had to I decided to move back to New York and I had to go up there without my family. So I had a lot of time on my hands. I was living with my in-laws and the piece of advice I'll give to your audience, especially if these younger people here, don't ever move in with your in-laws. <laughs> Even if you're moving to a new place and your family's back somewhere else, especially if your family, your in-laws are like the Costanzas on Seinfeld. And all they did was yell at each other. But I believe things happen for a reason. And the reason for that was it got me to leave the house before anybody woke up. And I would get to the office at 6.30 in the morning and the only person there was Seth. He was an early riser. And he, his brain was just exploding with all these new ideas with this fabulous new medium called the internet. And I just sat there and learned to shut up and listen. It was a great lesson about how important listening is. I was always in sales, so I knew about listening for the purpose of making a sale. But to me, this was more of a lesson in, you know, when you're around greatness or you're around people that have something important to say, and that could be your family, that could be friends, it's really important to sit back and listen. And I just absorbed. I was there when Seth wrote the, um, the article uh, called Permission Marketing that was in Fast Company that became a book and his first bestseller. And it's really where return and relationship concepts started. I, I always, I was always a, what I thought was a networker. I, I, everywhere I went, I made new relationships. I had them from every school I was in, from every job I had. I always left with, besides the mass of people I would meet, I always met a few people that became part of like my life ongoing. And what I learned uh, as years would go by, and this was a little bit later, is that I'm not really a networker as much as I am a community builder. And I like to say that a network gives you reach. 
but a community gives you power. Networks connect, but communities care. And I've got these first lessons listening to Seth and how he was talking about a new way to communicate with consumers, uh, getting their permission, being invited into their living rooms, per se. And mm. I, I'm making a motion with my hands because I'm sitting yeah, in yeah. my living room <laughs> and we're only audio. But it, 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 this is what really led me into this whole new world. And it progressed. And I went from there to 800 Flowers and I helped build th their employee-based advocacy and their, their corporate sales um, using the web. Um, went on to a company from there called um, Elf Cosmetics, which was really my introduction into social media. It was 2008. Social media platforms were first starting to scale. I was at a company that had no marketing budget. They brought me in because I was known for being innovative and trying new things. And they wanted a, a chief marketing officer that had a sales bent. And I shut down everything they were doing in social because it was all completely elementary and basically advertising based. And I, but I have to understand these platforms. So I found some, some smart people. I met a guy named Oz Sultan, who was really helpful to me in the, in the early days and helped me build the first aggregated content site for a brand for Elf, where anytime someone mentioned Elf in their content online, we sucked it into a place where our followers and our, our customers could see what other people were saying about our brand and could have conversations about it. And it was a tremendous learning experience for me. We grew the brand from 5 million to 50 million in sales in a couple of years. Uh, now I think Elf does probably close to $300 million in business and they have close to a billion dollar valuation. I left there a, a long time ago, back in 2010. But between eight, 2008 and 2010, I helped them build the largest online presence for a cosmetics company against the likes of Estee Lauder and, and L'Oreal and Sephora. Mm. But the fortunate part, and I, I say this because I think it's important to your audience, because I think a lot of them are small businesses, is that we were a small business. So we had the advantage of being incredibly nimble, of having just a few decision makers, and being able to try just about anything. And that was the best learning experience I had, is that experimentation and trying things and seeing what new platforms are out there and how you can make use of them were, were just a great advantage. Um, my next experience after that was a company called Open Sky that was, that was experimenting with peer-to-peer -peer commerce. Uh, they eventually, years later, just recently actually got bought by Alibaba. I went from there to a company called Collective Bias where I became a partner. And we were building content for brands using bloggers in a storytelling format at scale to help them sell their products back when the content and influencer revolution was, is, was in its infancy back in 2011. And that company was acquired, thank God. I pray every day and thank, I'm thankful for it in 2016. And now I'm working with my business partner from Collective Bias, John Andrews, who found who co-founded it um, on a company called Photify, again, trying to extend the ability of brands to scale content production, this time by using their employees. Hmm. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. I mean, there's a, there's a whole theme through that of, of experimentation in the new social media, but in a way that still comes back to the relationships and also you talked about community building and I'll I'll explore that with you in a moment but one of the things you said and fascinating I mean I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin so you talked about your time with him and and I'm not sure if Seth said this but it's kind of a message that to me encapsulates his whole philosophy and that's marketing is about building a relationship and it's about starting and you know you build a relationship by starting a conversation with someone who could be your ideal client so that that's kind of my encapsulation of his whole philosophy you mentioned listening and how important listening was to both sales but then also to to learning new things and in particular when you're experimenting then i guess listening to see what the what's resonating with people online and and what's giving results is really important how do you take the concept of listening into the social media space into the online space well one of the reasons i wrote the book how to look people in the eye digitally was to explain to people the need to make the kind of connection that people make when they're sitting across from each other which and how do you do that when you're sitting across from somebody? I mean, I don't know about you, but I was probably first. I was definitely first told about this by my parents, 
And Mm -hmm. one of the conversations that really stuck out in my head, my dad was about doing things for others and helping people clean up their yards. And if there were garbage cans in the street, you pull your car over or you stop your car and you put them away. You don't just leave it it because it's not yours, even if it's not a neighbor, even when you're miles from your home. The conversation I remember with my mom is I was going on my first date and she said to me, she said, son, make sure you look at her when she's talking to you. Make sure you let her know that she's the most important thing in the room. Because if you're sitting there looking at everybody else walking in when the door opens and Mm. you're looking up and every other girl that's walking by, she's going to know that she's not important to you. And it's going to hurt your chances of having what I'm sure you're looking for, which is a second date. Um, and this is back when I used to want second dates. Now I'm not so sure I even want first dates. <laughs> uh, 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 but it, it was a very, very important lesson. And what I realized when I got very involved with social media is that people thought clicking a button meant making a friend. They thought liking something meant you had a relationship. And, and what I like to do to, to express this to people, I, I speak um, internationally and I'm on a lot of stages, is I will jump off the stage and reach out to somebody in the audience and put out my hand to shake their hand and they'll reach back and they'll shake my hand and I'll say, are we friends now? Mm-hmm. And, and, and if they don't answer right away, I say, no, we're not. What that was, that handshake was a door opener to a friendship. But in order to become friends, we now need to engage. We need to have conversations. We need to pay attention to what each other's each other is doing. And now we have this amazing um, these platforms that allow us to do it. But people, like you said, LinkedIn people think it's just a a big resume builder, or or they think it is as as a as a sales uh, means yeah. of sending out spam emails, hoping that that one percent will answer. But the truth of the matter is, it's a huge opportunity to get to know something about someone. Like for instance, I went to your Facebook page and I see you're a cyclist. So that gives me the opportunity. If we were meeting and this was whether it was a sales call or it was an, an opportunity for me to get to know you, I would have an idea into a topic or two that I might be important to you. I know that you have a chemistry degree. I know the industries you worked in. What that does is it gives me the chance to start a conversation. So look, looking people in the eye digitally is doing what we used to do um, when we were face-to-face, but being able to do it via social platforms. And if you don't mind me taking it a step further, um, when I first graduated college, uh, I, I was in a sales job and my dad was in the sales field. And he calls me up the end of the first week and he knew that my goal was to get appointments. And he said, did you get any appointments? I said, yes. He goes, when's your first appointment? I said, next Thursday. He said, what time? I said, 10 o'clock. He goes, what time are you going to get there? I said, about five to 10. He goes, no, get there at nine o'clock, walk around the neighborhood, get to know, see what restaurants are there, what stores are there, go in the building, look up at the board and find out what other companies are there. Get into the office early and see if you can get to his or her office and see what diplomas on the wall. Are there other photos of children or family? Is he, is, she, is he or she a skier or a golfer? Find points of emotional connection that allow you to build a relationship. Don't go there to sell something. Go there to get to know this person. Now, back then, this was hard to do. Now, it's something that we all have at our fingertips, but what amazes me, Jurgen, is how many people don't even bother doing it. I don't know about you, but well, how, I bet this has happened to you. Somebody connects with you on LinkedIn. It ne- isn't necessarily the way you'd like them to connect, but you're intrigued for one reason or another. You might even just be testing to see if you're right and it's just a sales call. And you accept it. And the first question they ask you is, so, Jurgen, what do you do? What do I do? They didn't even bother reading your LinkedIn profile. I mean, it would, that's where they connected with you and they didn't even bother reading it. So, yeah, or even, um, even worse. I mean, and this happens quite a bit, although I'm, I'm very careful who I connect with now, but uh, so I connect with somebody and the first communication I get is, oh, we're selling this widget and, you know, it's on special right now. And if you order 10 of them, um, <laughs> you know, we can, we can get you in. They're, they're about to run out, but just for you. And I said, well, how do you even know I need that widget? I don't need the widget. You haven't, you, know, you haven't even paid any attention, first of all, to what my particular needs might be. You've just sent me a sort of a spam email. And besides, I don't even know you yet. So. Well, what I like to do with those is say, I'll take a million of them. As long as you can give me credit, net 10 years. 
<laughs> you know, but exactly. And, and, and uh, uh, of course, now we've been talking, I tend to go off on tangents. I forgot the exact question. Um, but for me, looking people in the eye digitally is getting to know who they are with all the tools we have available to us to allow us to do it. So I try very hard and it's work, but it's what helps me build my brand is that before I get on the phone with somebody, I do, even if it's just five minutes of preliminary research, again, find their Facebook page, find their LinkedIn page, see what they do for a living, see if they have a Twitter handle. You might've noticed I retweeted one or two of your tweets just to show the interest before the call. Hmm. Yeah, well, the question was really about listening and how does listening translate to to social, but I think you've answered the question yes. because you know one of the things I was told very early on, and this, this came out of some sales training that I did as well, was that listening is not just about um, being quiet and letting the other person talk. It's also about reflecting back what they've said, checking in and making sure you've understood yes. their their communication and also understood their intention, asking some intelligent questions to get them to elaborate further. And I think that's exactly what you've highlighted, how you might go about doing that on social media. And and also the important thing I think there is is getting to the point of building that emotional connection because I had somebody ask a question. I reposted a, a, um, a blog post from somebody and I can't remember exactly what the title was, but it was all about tapping into people's emotions with your marketing message. And the question was, well, that that's sounds very easy, but how do you actually go about doing that? And I think what you've given us there is pretty well a description of how you might start that. Well, one of the things I like to say is don't ask questions if you don't listen to or want to hear the answers. Hmm. Because I'm sure this has happened to you as well and to people in your audience. Somebody asks you a question and then they just tell you what they want to tell you anyway. Like you explain to them perhaps that, that the product they have doesn't work for you. And instead of saying, well, we might have a new product later, or what can we do to improve it that might make you interested? They just continue and try to sell you their product. Asking yeah. the question was really almost like just a checkbox on mm. their process. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Again, it's it's about connection, I think. Mm. All right. Now, um, one of the things that I read that you said in, and I can't remember whether it was in one of the books or in one, one of your many prolific blog posts that you put out, is referring to you know this idea content is king. That is kind of almost a universal truth these days. Um, but your take on that is you post content to start to build a relationship to generate engagement. Uh, rather than I think the conventional wisdom still is you post content to demonstrate that you are an expert and for a positioning exercise. So talk to us a little bit about that, what the differences are in approach and how that might play out. Well, I like to say that if content is king, then connection um, is queen and she rules the house. Um, hmm. it, 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 you're, you hit the nail on the head. You know, I don't um, certainly I put out some content because I want to own a topic. So like yeah. I, I write about return relationship. I write about how to look people in the eye digitally. I write about um, going to changing the mindset from targeting to matchmaking because it's a topic I want to be known for. But more importantly, I'm doing it because it creates, a, I like to say conversation is the best content. And if I can create a conversation with my content, then I've kind of done my job. Or if I can get a content idea related to, me. So a lot of people say to me sometimes, you know, oh, you know, there's other people writing about return relationship and they're not crediting you. And I don't care. I really, really don't care. Um, first of all, I am trying to share a topic that is very near and dear to me and important. Therefore, the more people talk about it and use it, the happier I am. The other mm. thing is when I get those calls from people saying, you know, Jurgen was on stage and he used one of your one liners, or he said, relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, the stronger and more valuable they become. But he didn't mention you. I'm like, that's fine because you just called me. Yeah. yeah. Therefore that created that engagement. And I, I like, I was talking about this other day, my business partner, the more content that you produce and the more content you produce that is makes an easy conversation, the more people will reach out and connect with you. So um, the, the CEO of, of Remax, uh, which is one of the largest real estate companies in the world, if not the largest sales companies, 
has started creating a lot of content. I met Adam a number of years ago. It was, I think, 2015, five years ago at a conference in, um, in, in San Diego. And he was just starting on his journey of starting to create content. But what I love about the fact that Adam creates content regularly is that I can engage with him without bothering him. I'm engaging with him in a place where he's happy to engage. In other words, if mm. he's a very important guy. He's running a multi-billion dollar company. If I sent him emails and texts every day, it would drive him crazy. And it wouldn't build yep. a relationship. It would probably hinder the relationship. But the fact that I share his content and that I make comments and that that's where we communicate, he's making it easy for me. To not think, oh my God, should I bother Adam today? Do I want to text him? Have I called him or emailed him too much? Whereas he's thrilled that I'm jumping in because it's creating conversation in his posts. So like when I, I post, I don't know how much research you did, but I, I post my socks um, a lot. I became very well known for wearing funky socks. And there's a whole blog post about it on tenrupin.com if you just search Ted Saki. I have my own hashtag. <laughs> like you've heard of a yeah. selfie. This is a sake, so it's Ted sake, which are my socks, and I'm known for it. And people a lot of times say to me, when are you going to stop doing this? I've been doing it since 2010. I've posted 1,500 um, Ted Sockies, and I, I post them when I'm going to events, when I'm always when I travel. Whenever I'm on a plane, you see my, my shoes and my socks in front of my laptop, and I make a comment. And I try to weave it into storytelling sometimes but with mm. what I'm doing. Um, but the beauty of it is it's allowed people to open a conversation with me on a topic that they're very comfortable with without having to do too much research. So people will, will text me or they'll see me somewhere and they'll go, what socks you wear? They just started a conversation without having to come up and go, hi, my name is Jurgen. Are you Ted Rubin? Do you mind if we talk for a minute? That's very uncomfortable for people. And it mm. can be very uncomfortable for the person that you're trying to start the conversation with. But if you're remarking about something like uh, that they do all the time, uh, there's a CMO who's a friend of mine who's a bike rider. And on Instagram, every day he posts his mountain bike rides. And, mm. and, and it's a, and it's a, people walk up to him all the time at conferences and they say, oh my God, the scenery in that last picture of yours was beautiful. And now a conversation ensues. So it, it, first of all, whether you're posting marketing content, which is great and gives people the opportunity to talk to you about something that you are, let's say, trying to be an expert about or a field that is important to you, or you're simply posting about your socks or your bike riding, or I just took up jujitsu. I'm 62 years old and I just started and I'm writing about, you know, my, my, my experience is there. I believe that the more you share about yourself, the more human you are, as we talked earlier, the more personal you'll make it, the more you let people into your world and make them comfortable to reach out with, to you and connect with you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really important point. I've got um, I've had a similar experience. I mean, I'm not as disciplined as you with socks, but I we have uh, an almond tree in our front yard, and um, it kind of overhangs the front first floor bel outdoor balcony, which is nice. Mm -hmm. But at this time of year, we have parrots and uh, lorikeets come in. So lorikeets wow. are beautiful, multicolored rainbow lorikeets that steal the almonds essentially I, I kind of post these photos and the lorikeets are actually quite tame you can get to a couple of meters away or even a meter i've been um and with a long lens camera take some wonderful shots because uh they don't move that rapidly and they'll actually have a conversation with you you know they'll actually tweet back at you the other the bigger parrots are a little bit harder to capture on photo yeah. but i i post all these photos and then i make comments about them stealing the almonds because the almonds don't ripen until about another three months um, for human consumption. And of course, by that time, they're all gone. Uh, <laughs> so I, I make all these comments about these parrots. And, you know, and then, I, of course, I joke and say that because I love photography and I actually like the birds being there and, and it's, it's beautiful to have them so close by that, you know, and I reflect on that people, people actually keep, keep, sort of some of these birds in cages as pets and and how cruel would that be and here we are with you know they just come and visit us every day for a few months and and so that and i've been to networking events and met people and they oh we've seen some of your fo bird photos right. and they're really fantastic you know and, and like you say that strikes up a conversation immediately did did you do you post them on instagram uh, I them? haven't. I have. I've been posting them on Facebook, but I've started up an Instagram account, a, a one that's just for my photos now. I, so I'm there are to, a few uh, there. If you could just shoot me the the uh, 
um, the handle so I can follow you. I'd love to, I'd love to see them. I'm heading out to, uh, I go out twice a year to Phoenix, Arizona, and I go up into the mountains in a town called Pine. And my wrestling coach from high school and junior high lives there. And him and his wife are like second parents to me. And they have this beautiful house that backs up to the national forest and they get hummingbirds all over oh, the place. Wow. Yeah. And I, and you can also get close to them and I yeah. get some videos and it's funny you say, because people love when I post those, but I don't live there. It's so like, but I would love to see your photos. So if you yeah, can send yeah. me that handle, that would be great. All right. I'll do that. Okay. Now, um, one of the things, you know, we've talked about content creation and, and building that engagement and, I guess uh, there's a couple of questions for me there. The first one is probably a technical question, and that's, you know, a lot of people, me included, um, write blog posts. Uh, this podcast, for example, becomes a blog post and then share a little bit of a snippet of that on the social media and put a, um, put a link back to the original content. Uh, so that's one form. Then, of course, the other form of content on social media is actually writing a short paragraph or some comments or a little story or whatever it might be in social media itself without a link back anywhere else to generate the engagement. What sort of balance should you strike between those two? Uh, I, I don't think there are any set rules. I think you have to see what works best for you. First of all, every audience is different. Every person is different. And everybody's goals are different. So what what I think is the most important thing is how do you scale that? How do you do, especially if you're a small well, business? Well, that was the next question, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'll combine the two. So yeah. first of all, I don't believe there's any tried and true rules about how you should mix it, what you should do. I think you should test, retest, and then test again. See what mm -hmm. happens. See if you can increase your engagement. I find that if I post a link to a blog post, I get much more action if I actually take the words from the blog post and just post it into Facebook as a post without the link to the website. Mm -hmm. Because I find that people, every time someone clicks, and this is old digital learning, every click you lose people. Every yep. time someone has to go deeper, you lose people. So if you give someone snackable content, I mean, if you notice, Seth Godin's posts are incredibly short. Hmm. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because he knows people's uh, attention spans are short. And I don't know about you, but I have probably 20 uh, windows opened up on my laptop for articles <laughs> that I need to get back to and finish yeah. because I started reading them. They were too long. I didn't have time. Whereas yeah, I never right. do that with a post of Seth's because it's quick, it's snackable, it's very br it's brilliant. He's very good at it. He puts mm. across a very smart idea in a very short period of space. So here's a couple of the things I do. I write blog posts, um, and and it, it, this is interchangeable. Very often I will write something on Facebook that just came to my mind. It'll be a paragraph, and then I'll say, oh, wow, that would make a great blog post. And either I just take the, the paragraph and make it a blog post, or I extend on it in a blog because I feel there's more room there. It's static. It's something I want to save. I think everyone should have a blog because you own it. Mm. Unlike Facebook that tomorrow could, you could lose access to all of your content. Um, and then what I do with blog posts is I will post the post. Like you said, put the link in, put a little blurb at the top, maybe just the title. I always post my blog post, but then I will go back and I will pull paragraphs that makes sense unto themselves. And I tend to write this way. My, my writing tends to be each paragraph could be a standalone post. And it's a great way to think about it. And it doesn't happen all the time, but then I will take those paragraphs and I will put them into a post. And then I will test if I just do writing, does it do as well as if I put an image with it? So I have a whole library of images that I've had taken by a, uh, by a photographer named John D'Amato, who I think is the best at personal branding because it's not just static headshots. It's me speaking. It's me exercising. It's we, me with my niece and nephew. It's all different types of photos. And over time, I built up a big library. And you don't need someone professional to do this. Before I worked with John, I did a, most of these photos were just taken by friends of mine or me or something. And I use, I, I tend to use my own photos because again, I'm building me into people's heads. I'm hmm. building my face associated with the content. You've probably seen some of my posts where I take my, my, my one liners and I put them into the photos as a, as a thing itself yeah. that it's right on the photo. But what I'll do is I'll break it down into paragraphs. I'll do them sometimes by themselves. I'll do them with photos to see which ones get more 
interaction, which get more engagement, which get more likes, which get more views. I also posted everything I post, I post everywhere. I syndicate. So I posted at Instagram, I posted at Facebook, I posted at LinkedIn. Um, I, I, I am very um, opposed to people that tell you what content should and shouldn't be posted on LinkedIn. And I have blog posts about that in, in tedrubin.com if you want to check it out. I'm the guy all the time on LinkedIn saying, don't tell me what I should post here and what I shouldn't. Yeah. If you don't, if the, here's the beauty of social media uh, is that social media is the ultimate in permission marketing. Hmm. If you don't like what I post, don't follow me. Yeah. It's, it's right. very simple. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And if you see something posted that is clearly personal and it's in the LinkedIn feed and you don't like it, scroll by it and keep going. I believe, and I think we've, we've been discussing this throughout, I believe in personalizing things. I think in today's day and age, people want to know who they're dealing with. They want to know what, you're, what, what you believe in, what's important to you. It doesn't have to be aligned with what they believe. Hmm. It's just it's more about who that person is, how they spend their time. Now, you might not want to share everything. I'm very transparent. I share everything. I share my politics. I share about the trials and tribulations of being a divorced dad. I share all this content on stages in front of business audiences, uh, less politics on the business audiences, although I'll make comments here and there. But usually I'll use it as an example rather than you know, harp on it. But I talk a lot about being a divorced dad and how I had to learn to focus on my daughters and how I had to learn to change my expectations and, uh, and the fact that this dad won't quit and that I'll never give up. And I can't tell you how many relationships is built for me how many senior executives in the C-suite have related to me and built relationships with me more about being a dedicated dad than about being a marketer. Hmm. And it, it, it's made them really talk to me, talk about looking people in the eye digitally or talking personally. I'll be at an event. They'll pull me aside and say, you know, I've been reading about your experiences. Can we sit down and have a cup of coffee? And I get more real attention. And then what does that do? Now, it didn't have to be about marketing or about sales. It led to a relationship. It means that person takes my calls. It means yeah. that person listens to me. So, you know, I, I just think that those things are very important. Hmm. Yeah. And and the other thing that strikes me, because I think back to my days in, in the corporate world, and I wasn't in sales as such, but I did have a strong interaction in in marketing roles and technical service roles with our sales team and did lots of sales training and there was a lot of stuff there that focused on the relationship and you know there was always in those days golf was the the networking um right. activity if you like so you know you'd go out and play golf with people and i i disliked playing golf a i was not very good at it and i, I sort of did just felt it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't something i enjoyed i mean that's just a personal thing and i i thought well i'm not going to go and play golf with somebody just for the sake of building a relationship because to me that feels inauthentic and a lot of people i know only played golf to network so right. it wasn't that they were keen golfers they only played golf to network and to meet people. And to me, that felt a little bit inauthentic. And it was, uh, you know, I, I always had mixed feelings about that. It was kind of the technical approach to, yes, you've got to uh, build that emotional connection with people and and build the relationships. But it was very transactional to me, whereas right. what you're describing is very authentic and very personal. So you basically, the things that are, dear to your heart you talk about and the people that resonate with that and find that they've got something in common with you they're the ones that you actually build a genuine connection with right and, and just to jump back for a second i want to give a few more tips about repur like if you repurpose content you can create a lot more content than you might otherwise think you do so if you write mm -hmm. a blog post turn it into into five different facebook posts you can turn it into tweets all my blog posts i go through them and i write tweets out of them and then I save every tweet I write that I think is smart. Now, I think I'm smart, so I have a <laughs> lot of them. Um, but, 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 but I also pay attention. Like if someone, if no one pays attention to something I wrote, if I wrote relationships are like muscle tissue and nobody cared, I probably would let it fall off into the background. But what I do is I turn a lot of my blog posts into multiple tweets. Then I save those tweets in my, I like them. 
because they say you save all your. I don't know if you know if you use Twitter much, but you can save those and then you can reuse them again and again and again. Like, don't be afraid to repost content. Don't be afraid to use content again and again and again as long as it's evergreen, meaning that it's it's good all the time. It's not based on a date or a time or a very particular topic. And you can keep using that content in different ways. So every piece of content you create, I turn tweets into blog posts. I turn blog posts into tweets. I turn them into Facebook posts. Like I have more content than I know what to do with. Every time I go into my photos to look for something, I find a hundred photos. I'm like, oh my God, I have to post that again. Mm. Like this happens all the time. And you'll find if you start creating that content and saving it, like I have all different files on my on my phone for all different types of photos, for different places, for different things, for different topics. Same thing for tweets. Then I always have content at my fingertips. So whenever I have a free moment, I can jump in and post something new that will hopefully spark conversation. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. I, I'm a huge fan of repurposing. And I didn't actually know that you could save tweets in Twitter. Um, we we keep a collection in a document of all the tweets and I do go back and, and go through that from time to time and think, oh, that's a good one to post today. And, you know, depending on the theme of the week that we might be working on. Well, it, I just, I use the like function. So when you like something, it saves it in what's called a likes file on Twitter. Oh, okay. So, so instead of liking other people's tweets, which I will sometimes, but usually I'll just do that for a short period of time and then I'll get rid of it like, you know, a few, a week later, I save all of my favorite content so that I can easily access it and use it again. Hmm. Oh, there's a little uh, tip. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. Okay. Now, one of the things um, you touched on earlier and I was going to come back to, which I'll do now is uh, building a network versus building a community. Um, now, why is it much more important to focus on the community side? Well, I, like I said, and, and I'm going to repeat something I said earlier, a network gives you reach, but a community gives you power. And, and th let's think about this from a perspective that everybody in your audience can understand. You live in a neighborhood. It's a community. Your kids go to a school. You know a lot of your neighbors. Just think about if somebody is walking down the street near your house and you get a call from your neighbor saying somebody's looking outside your house or you go on a vacation and someone keeps an eye on your house or you go out for the evening and you get a call from your neighbor saying, I think your son or daughter is having a party at your house. Mm, I didn't know that was happening. You know, again, communities support each other. Network mm. is simply a series of nodes. And those nodes give you connection to other people. But a community is a group that works together, that shares information, that shares knowledge, that supports each other. So a, a good example of, a, uh, of the way a community will function in social media is if you, if you start a group on Facebook or if you have a group of people you work with and you say, hey, everybody, when we post content, let's share each other's content. Now, you know, every time you post a blog post, you're going to get a certain amount of likes. Or every time you go on Facebook, you can reach out to the community and say, I just posted something on Facebook. Would you mind liking it? Why? Because now the algorithm puts it in front of more people. Now, the way people game that system, which is very transparent and I'm not a fan of, is you might have noticed people on Facebook, they put 50 people's names in the Facebook post, mm -hmm. right? So they write something and under it, they, 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 they just keep tagging people. How transparent is that? I mean, at half the time, I don't even know these people that tag me or yeah. I haven't spoken to them in years. And all they're doing that for is they assume, first of all, a lot of people don't even pay attention. You're tagged in something, you like it. Or they think it'll bring their attention to something. I'm a big believer in build those relationships and then reach out to those people if you want them to, to do it. I don't do that a lot. I say, again, I save favors. I save people supporting me. I try to create my support organically. I serendipitously every day share people's tweets, share people's Instagram posts, like their content because people will notice that you've been going there often and then they will, you'll just try this once, go to Instagram and just take a couple of days and like a lot of people's content. And I guarantee you, you'll see some of those people come back and like your content because it brings you top of mind. It's also a reciprocal kind of thing. So I like to do it in a way that, that, that people do it organically. But more, but the other part is, again, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to people and saying, hey, I just posted something, or let's create a group and support each other hmm. and share each other's content. 
So I think that's what communities do. And I think that's why they're so important. And, and something I've always done is everywhere I've gone, I've built communities. And then what I do is I overlap my communities. Now, you might, might remember there was something called Google+. Plus. Do you remember Google+. Plus? Yes, yes. Do you, remember, do you remember the original concept of Google+. Plus? It was supposed to be a social network. And mm. their concept was wonderful. The concept was you have different groups of people in different That's places. Right. Why mm. not set them up in circles? And then some of those circles will intersect like a Venn diagram. Mm. And you'll have – you'll also you'll, – you'll see in a lot of them is that place where people are a part of multiple of your communities. And those will tend to be your strongest relationships. But it, it managed to keep people separately. So w- what what I believe is that when you share people's groups like that – that content then crosses over into other groups and it just gets you more exposure, more people that see what you're doing, more people that like what you're doing, and it builds multiple communities. So you can be a part of many different communities. Now, something else you might have heard of, and I forgot who is the author of this, but there's been many studies that were, most of them are older, saying that you can only be in touch with 150 people. A lot of it is this negative social media stuff that you can't have five, ten, five or 10,000 people you're connected to and still have relationships with them. Now, here's where I disagree with that. I believe that's probably true. I know the way my mind works and how many people I can keep track of. But I believe you become parts of different circles at different – it can be different points of the day. Mm. It can be different points of the week of your life. So I just started doing jujitsu. So I've started collecting jujitsu videos. I've started following some people who are into it so I can learn from them. And now I'm a part of that community. And within that community, I have the space to build a certain amount of relationships. Then I have a marketing community. Then I, I, like, I like working out. I play golf. I, I cycle. There's all different places in your life where you can build these. And when you build a community, it's that much stronger. First of all, not only does a community support you, but a community also draws you back. You, you, someone reaches out to you. Jurgen reaches out and says, "Hey, Ted, you know, I, I haven't seen you lately posting photos of birds. You know, like you're. I thought you were like you should get. And and I don't get upset. I go, oh man, I've been so busy. I forgot about mm. that. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of interaction and a lot of play that comes about from being a part of a community. But most importantly, it's the support that you get. I mean, LinkedIn is a community, and it, it operates as a network." But the truth of the matter is, if I'm connected to you and you're connected to somebody else, the likelihood of them connecting with me because of you is if I reach out to you and you connect us versus me just reaching out on my own. And that's mm. part of being a part of a community. Yeah, yeah. And and LinkedIn's actually geared towards that. It's You can actually ask for an introduction to somebody else through a connection. Right, but, but but you but use it properly. Use it in mm. a way that's that that that's contextual, not just oh, I see you're connected, and then I call <laughs> you up and ask you to connect me to ten different people, and then I go and spam them, and and then yeah. you don't want to do it yeah. for me again. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I one of my kind of rules is I I will look at the profile if I get an invite, but one of my rules is if the person hasn't taken the time. Uh, to at least send me a note with that invite. And it doesn't really matter what the note says as long as it's kind of halfway personalized. Like I saw right. you, you know, I read your LinkedIn profile. I'm interested to connect and maybe even a reason. Then I'll go and have a look at their profile. Um, but it's rare that I will connect with somebody that just sends me an invitation with nothing on it. Right. But, and then what I do is even when I do occasionally accept those invitations, it might be someone I, I just met hmm. and I will write back to them and say, even though we just met, I, my suggestion to you is that you put in a personal note in the future. Um, uh, uh, or it might be a, a, a senior executive that I'd love to be connected to. And clearly it's not the kind of person that just blankets invitations. Yeah, yeah. They must've had a reason. Um, but then I, I always write back a personal note. I never accept a LinkedIn request without writing back to the person mm. that sent it to me. And it can be a thank you for reaching out, looking forward to engaging and connecting. I noticed that you went to university of Pennsylvania. My daughter went there, or I'm a big fan of Philly. Or if I see the persons from park city, Utah, I might say, I love to ski. I won't even mention they're from park city. But if they're paying attention, they'll know that I must have noticed they were from Park City, and that's why I mentioned skiing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that's all great advice. So this is fascinating, Ted. I could go on for ages and 
talk more about social media and we haven't even touched on uh, things like autoresponders and bots, but I'm guessing that you're probably not a huge fan of those. <laughs> well, you can see a post on my site about about making marketing human and yeah. and that, that that bots are not ready for prime time. So yeah. yes, I'm not a big autoresponder robot guy. And I'll tell you what, Jurgen, I've enjoyed this. We can do this another time because clearly if we go much longer, no one's going to want to keep listening. But we, can, <laughs> yeah. we can set up another time to talk and cover some other topics. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's a good time to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's primarily designed for innovators and leaders in their fields to give them some tips from your experience. And and I know you've got you know lots of experience in the marketing world beyond just social media that we've been talking about today. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today. I hope I can help. Yeah. So firstly, what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, I think they need to open their mind to other people's opinions. I think they need to learn. We talked about listening and then you mentioned how it's not just about listening. I like to say it's about hearing people. Um, I don't know if they have this expression in Australia, but um, it, it, it's, do you, are you hearing me? Means, are you really listening? So I think to be innovative, you really need to pay attention to what people are talking about and what they're saying. Mm. Yeah, and, and that's good advice. And you've, you know, you've clearly kind of taken that philosophy into the social media space with what we've been chatting about today. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Talking to my business partner, John Andrews, uh, I have to tell you that we've decided that for now on when we take, we like to take road trips and we drive in the car and we set up to see, we try to see different people around the country. We go places serendipitously that we just decide to go in the day. And we were having these amazing conversations and we'd forget a lot of what we talked about. So our, our goal going forward is to, for now on to use one of the apps on our iPhones and record those conversations. And there's a gentleman that I work with who's an old, someone I call one of the best technical marketers I know. His name is Joe Hage. Um, and he runs a company called Medical Marcom, which is in the medical marketing field. And Joe now records every single conversation he has. And of mm. course, he deletes a lot of it. But I think that's really important because when you have conversations with people, um, it's amazing. Like for me, I find the best way for me to innovate is to talk to somebody that gets me out of my skin, that gets me talking about new things, that new ideas pop up. And as you asked, what's the best for me? For me, what I found, what's the most consistent one that creates great ideas is talking to my business partner, John Andrews. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. I like the idea of recording the conversations. I mean, essentially, that's what I'm doing with these these podcasts. And like you say, these conversations, I often come away, well, I always come away totally inspired but i often come away with a bunch of new ideas that that i kind of immediately make a note of all the things that i'm going to follow up on or or maybe even implement i have to tell you that I, when i used to do a lot of consulting where i'd be brought into meetings to brainstorm and i'd say to the clients um you better record this or have someone taking notes because i don't record myself that this is back then i didn't mm. and i and i don't take notes um, and it, you might ask me the next day about something, but, and I will, if you, if you can give me just a reminder, I'll be able to jump back into it. So I, I've just learned that my best ideas come up when I'm debating, when I'm having conversations, when I'm talking about new things. And if you record those things, you can always refer back. And then one other little tip is when John and I are having these conversations, every once in a while we'll come up with a tidbit that we really love and what I'll do. And I also do this when I wake up in the middle of the night is I tweet it out. Hmm. Because then by the time we're done with our conversation, and just like if it's in the middle of the night, by the time I wake up in the morning, I've got immediate feedback. People yeah. liked it. People commented. People jumped in. The, my first thing about return on relationship was I just used that term to the founders of, um, of, of Elf Cosmetics when they were trying to ask me why I wouldn't market to the people that we were building our social media presence with. It was very early. I said, don't want you trying to sell them anything. And mm -hmm. I said, because it's about return on relationship. And they were like, what's return of relationship? And then thank God they said to me, um, we don't have time for this right now. We have another meeting. Let's talk about it at the end of the week. And I went and tweeted it out. And the feedback that came back was tremendous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that story. That's great. Now, you might have answered this question already. What's the what's a favorite resource that you use most often? Um, when you say resource, do you mean platform, like resource? Well, just it could be a platform. It could be software. It could be you, like I'm thinking you've answered it in form of a phone to record conversations. Uh, I, I, I'm a I'm a 
uh, phone to record conversations. I'm a social media guy. I like to look at what's trending on Twitter. I like to get up in the morning and see what people are discussing. So for me, my best resource is putting content out there and seeing how people react to it. Hmm. All right. And what's the best way to keep a client on track? Ooh, that's that's a tough one. Um, I, it may, maybe you guys could teach that to me. Um, I, 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 I find that's incredibly difficult. Uh, but what I find is one of the best ways to get clients on track is I get paid at the beginning of the month, not at the end. So you pay me and now you want to get value out of me. So whereas if you pay me at the end of the month, you might not return calls, you might do something. It's just like I have a, I have a very close associate named Alan Levy who runs a company called SellUp. And he takes over the email marketing uh, for e-commerce purposes for medium to large, like $5 million to $100 million companies. And he, he works strictly off of a, a lift in sales and gets a percentage. But for the first three months, he gets paid a monthly fee hmm. because he knows that if he doesn't, the teams that he's getting assigned to work with will put shove them aside, not necessarily work with them. But when people are laying out a dollar, especially in advance, they want to get their money's worth. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's a good approach to take, and and as you say, it it uh, means that they've got skin in the game. So exactly. Yeah. And when they when people know, look, not everybody can do that. I understand. Hmm. Uh, I because I'm willing to walk away. I will not work unless I get paid in advance, unless it's for a Fortune 500 company who I know can't do that. Yeah. Uh, but even some of those I'll push with. Um, it, it, it explain yourself, and very often companies will understand because they know that the guy hiring you is not necessarily the guy that's going to be using your services mm. and he wants his team to have skin in the game yeah yeah all right um now what's the number one thing you think anyone can do to differentiate themselves uh be themselves i always yeah. say to people mm. be you it's very hard to take on a persona to be <laughs> somebody else when you're yourself it's very easy to answer questions you don't have to think about it so years and years ago when i was fighting to keep my daughters in my life uh, i was in court and every time I was on the stand, attorneys who were, in the, who were out waiting for the next case would come up to me and say, oh, my God, you're like incredible on the stand. Like, it's too bad they don't have a designated um, testifier the way they have a designated hitter in baseball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. You, could, you could make a lot of money. And I said, well, I probably couldn't because the reason is I'm being myself. I'm being honest. I'm being straightforward. I'm speaking from my heart. I don't have to think about my answers. So I think the best way to differentiate yourself is to be you. There's an there's a, uh, old Dr. Seuss um, quote that I quoted to my daughters all the time they were growing up. It says, be who you are, say what you feel, be who you are and say what you feel because those who mind don't matter um, and those who matter don't mind. Mm. And when you're yourself, it's a lot easier to build your personal brand. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I love Dr. Seuss because I think he also said no one is you than you. It, no one is you than you, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and as you point out, it, it uh, does take a lot of energy to try and pretend to be somebody else or to... <laughs> And then you have to think about it. And if you're somebody yeah. different for every different place you're working, you know, like now, now let me just make one caveat. I understand there are points of people's lives where mm. they have to take on work that might not be perfectly suited to them. Though after I fought to keep my kids in my life, I was, I was seven figures in debt, six figures in debt. And I took on any consulting gig I could get and said yes to anything just because I had to do it. But mm. it, it didn't work best for me. And as soon as I was past that point and paid back all the debt I had, I went back to, to being myself. My blog might be tedrubin.com, but it's called Straight Talk. I say mm. it like it is. When companies hire me, when I'm on stage, I'm going to speak my mind. If that doesn't work for you, then I'm probably not the guy you want to work with. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right. Well, thanks, Ted. This has been really fantastic. Now, you mentioned tedrubin.com. Where else can people reach out and learn more about you and perhaps even get in touch and say thank you for what you've shared today? Well, I'm really easy to find. First of all, just Google Ted Rubin and the first 14 to 15 pages at the very least are all about, about me. Um, Facebook, I'm Ted Rubin. LinkedIn, I'm Ted Rubin. It's T-E-D-R-U-B-I-N. My phone number is 516 270 Five five one one. Feel free to call me. My email address is tedrubin at gmail.com. 
These are the numbers and email address that I actually use. So again, there's tedrubin.com. Also, I have a blog called returnonrelationship.com. But the major purpose of that blog is to explain return on relationship and to give some return on relationship. So every week I share somebody else's content on that site. It's very rarely mine unless there's a really important message I need to get out. So I serendipitously share other people's content and then share it via social media. Hmm. Great. Well, thanks for that. We'll post oh, one all la- those one links. La- one last yeah. thing. Um, I, I would just recommend your audience, again, if you're looking to build your personal brand, if you have a small business, check out photify.com, P-H-O-T-O-F-Y. It's a great app for for adding branded content to photographs and allowing your employees to create themselves. So we call it, instead of user-generated content, we call it, empl- instead of employee created um generated content we call it employee created content it makes them feel a part of the creative process and makes them feel more a part of the company and the team great all right well we'll post all of those links in the show notes so that people can click straight through and and yeah photify is a really neat app i i've been playing with that a little bit since since we got connected and uh, part of my research um and i think that's going to be really useful for us and by the way, it's a, it's a great point. If people watch, and you probably noticed, I very rarely talk about Photify, but I use Photify. Hmm. So I'm leading by example. I'm showing people, and what happens is people go, hey, what's that Photify all about? Or, wow, I see that on all your photos. It leads people to ask a question. I did the same thing at, at Collective Bias. I never spoke about Collective Bias. I just framed all my presentations or put, or, or had a, a, um, a, a tag for Collective Bias, and then people would ask me about it instead of me selling it to them. I like yeah. to say that I prefer to get – pref- instead of selling myself, I prefer to get bought. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. I heard somebody else say that recently, but I can't remember who now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, um, what what – piece of advice, sort of parting piece of advice would you like to leave our listener today, particularly if they want to be a leader in their field or in innovation? Well, I'd like to give them two pieces of advice before I leave. I'd like to say that relationships are like muscle tissue. The more you engage them, the stronger and more valuable they become. That's, That's one thing that's very important. And then I want them to understand that a brand is what a business or a person does but a reputation is what people remember and share. Always keep that in mind in everything you do. And if you build relationships and you're good to people and you look to support people wherever you can, then your reputation will grow. Hmm. Yeah, that's great advice. Thanks for that. And finally then, who would you like me to chat with on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why? Oh, you definitely have to speak with my business partner, John Andrews. You'll love him. Yeah. He's innovative. He's a thought leader in the retail space. Um, it, it would be a great follow-up to our conversation because the reason we are such great partners is we talk about and 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 are specialists in different things, and we tend to complement each other. So I think he'd be a great guy to, for you to talk to. And another person I think you should talk to is a gentleman by the name of David Breyer, B-R-I-E-R. First name, David. David is probably the best branding specialist I know. Um, He's brilliant. His content is brilliant. If you look, you'll be able to find both of them. I've done videos with the two of them, so you can get a little perspective on them and the way we are alike and the way we differ. But I I think you would love them both. And I think they'd be, both of them would be an an incredible value to your audience. Great. Well, we'll... um get an introduction from you to both John and David and and we'll reach out to them and have them on for a conversation as well. I'd be happy to do that. Well, thanks a lot again, Ted, for sharing your time and your insights so generously with us today on the Innova Buzz podcast. I've really enjoyed this. I've picked up a few tips. As I said, I always learn from these conversations and I'm glad I recorded it and I'm really looking forward to sharing this with my audience as well. So all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thanks so much, Jorgen. I really appreciate it. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that insightful and informative conversation with Ted and took something away from his episode, something that you can take action on. Ted gave some very practical examples of building connections and community through social media, and he even demonstrated how he'd begun that process with me after we connected. I'd love to know what you took away from Ted's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at 
innovabiz.co forward slash Ted Rubin. That is T E D R U B I N. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Ted Rubin. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Ted there, as well as links to his website, his social media pages, and the other resources such as Photify that we spoke about in the conversation today. Ted suggested that we have a conversation with John Andrews, who is the CEO of Photify, and also with David Breyer, who's a brand specialist on future InnovaBuzz podcast episodes. So, John and David, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Ted Rubin. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, it will enable you in less than 30 minutes to gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery or our help with producing your very own podcast, even launching your very own podcast if you don't yet have one, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we can set up a quick call to have a short conversation and find out whether we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again to the next episodes of the InnovaBuzz podcast where we've got even more fantastic guests lined up, including writing coach Amanda Turner and James Hayes of Developmental Edge. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have. So go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovabiz.